Hello and welcome to Greatest Somerville. This special episode today is March 19, 2019. I'm Joe Lynch. My guest makes his second appearance on Greatest Somerville. John Dalton is the general manager of the MBTA Green Line Extension. Now well under construction, the Green Line Extension will incorporate seven new stops on the existing Green Line Rapid Transit System. The new extension will connect the downtown Boston system to East Cambridge, all of Somerville, and serve the Tufts University and Hillside communities of Medford. The project was officially given the green light when the federal government approved the $2.3 billion project in April of 2017. Mr. Dalton's first appearance on this show, the day after the full funding announcement, opened with me asking him how it felt to be the most loved person in Somerville. Now, almost two years later and three days before the first of many bridge closures and detours due to the massive construction project, I'll ask John how it feels to be not so loved anymore. Welcome back to Greater Somerville, John Dalton. Thanks, Thank Joe. you for coming back. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I, I called you a very brave man coming back uh, three days before the big and the first of the bridge closures. But we're going to talk bridge closures, construction update, and station design. Okay. We are scheduled to completely close the Broadway Ball Square Bridge at 10 p.m. on Friday night. The pushback has been loud. People don't understand why that bridge has to be closed completely. I'm going to take a layman stab at it, knowing that that bridge, the way it's constructed with the granite blocks that support the superstructure, is too narrow to accommodate the two new tracks that are needed for the Green Line, which necessitates the complete demolition of the bridge. Have I got that right? That's right. That's, okay. that's, that's partially right. That's right. Okay. People in this city do remember when the Ball Square Bridge was closed before due to safety concerns. And what the Commonwealth did was they completely lifted the platform off and rebuilt that. Mm. It did not necessitate the complete closure for a year. So I'm going to let you take it away on that Broadway Bridge because I know people who are watching this show tonight are going to say why the whole thing has to be closed. Thank you, Joe, for having me back. <laughs> um, it is good to be back on your show, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to, to share with your, your viewers um, what's happening on the Green Line Extension Project, because um, considering where this project was two and a half years ago, um, where the question wasn't how long will the bridges be closed, or what will the stations look like, or <clears throat> when will revenue service begin, the question was if anything is going to happen at all. So. While all these things are inconvenient and disruptive and um, perhaps not desirable, they are all demonstrating the fact that the Green Line extension is a real is a reality. And where, we can see it. And we can see it where it wasn't so long ago where that was a big question mark in itself. So that said, um, <clears throat> I, I don't negate or, or um, take anything away from the inconveniences people are going to experience soon. Um, and they're going to be real. And it'd be it'd be disingenuous to you and, and to your viewers to suggest anything otherwise. But let's talk about the Broadway Bridge. As you say, Broadway Bridge is scheduled to close this, this coming Friday, uh, March 22nd, and it'll be closed for 12 months. That is the current schedule. Uh, I will say with the bridge closure and everything else associated with this project, everything that can be done to make things happen faster than scheduled will be done faster mm -hmm. than scheduled, and that applies definitely to the bridge. Um, Broadway Bridge is, is a unique engineering puzzle um, for, for a few reasons. Um, first of all, you mentioned a, the previous project that was done um, some years ago to, to improve some of the bridge's infrastructure. What we're doing now is an entirely different project. Um, not only are we replacing the bridge that vehicles currently drive on, we are elongating the bridge about 100% mm -hmm. um, in order to allow what is today only enough width below for two tracks, for the existing commuter rail tracks, to not only provide space for two additional tracks for the Green Line extension, but also, <clears throat> as you look at the design plans, you'll see the Ball Square station sits 
immediately north of Broadway Bridge mm -hmm. in its future configuration, mm -hmm. which means that because all of the Green Line stations are what we call island platforms, meaning that the platform sits in between tracks, as, as the train profile, as the track profile approaches stations, the, the tracks uh, have to flare a little mm -hmm. bit to some degree. So not only are we adding space for two additional tracks, it's also a little bit wider than it would be normally just because you're making space for the, few, the, the platform, that's, the a, platform that, that's a little itself. further away. Right. Yeah. So that's just part of like the big picture thing of the, of the bridge. What makes it a little trickier is um, if one looks at the underside of the bridge, which I know is not a perspective most people can have, the structural members of the bridge um, don't run parallel with vehicular traffic on top. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't run in the same path as a car travels. They're kind of at diagonals, mm -hmm. which um, means that a more phased closure approach, where you might close, you know, all the all the all the lanes heading towards Medford first, and then tackle one the, lane closure. Yeah, on. yeah, right. kind of a phased approach. It doesn't work because those those structural members are more at diagonals mm -hmm. on the bottom side of Broadway Bridge, or you know, so there was no um, elegant solution, elegant or or more importantly, again at the time, remember this is going back three years, or cost effective way to get the bridge rebuilt and widened um, in a way that wouldn't really trigger a big cost overrun. So, Let me throw my three cents in on yeah. the cost effective part of it because there were many people who said, well, you know, we traveled over this bridge that had to be completely demolished, but they put a temporary bridge in place just to allow one lane of traffic or pedestrians or bicyclists. But those are the cost constraints that you've been handed as part of the project. If you had another hundred million dollars, you may have been able to do some kind of temporary sure. crossing. Sure. But you were handed the checkbook and said, that's all the money there is. That with very clear orders. Okay. That's right. So, so when people look at Mr. Dalton and they say, well, how come you couldn't do this? John Dalton was handed the project and said, here's the money that you have to complete that project. Yeah. And that, and just to jump ahead a little bit to something else I know we want to talk about, the design. You know, there are lots of things that would be great to have, you know, partially as a, a runaround bridge for the Broadway closure. It'd be great to have that, not to inconvenience, you know, the, the, the people who travel across that bridge every day or walk across the bridge or bike across the bridge every day. But just like the bridge, um, you know, the same applies to station designs. Mm -hmm. People have great ideas. Mm -hmm. But again, we are operating in a very, you know, tight budget constraint. We all know what happened on what I call GLX episode one, where you know, cost constraints really weren't measured mm -hmm. and tracked mm -hmm. and risks were not ac accurately accounted for. And it would be, you know, to sit in this chair I sit in, um, irresponsible for me to not treat every day with that same rigor as we did, as we kind of did the redesign process two and a half years ago. I'm gonna jump in and I'm just gonna say, for somebody who was on the very beginning of this whole project, which was, uh, Joe Curt Mayor Joe Curtatoni asked me to be on the first advisory committee in 2004. Mm. And by the time I saw what had ballooned into this kind of Disneyland fantasy land of station design, I was giving warnings to certain people saying, I don't know how much money you think you're going to get out of the federal government, but this thing is ballooning. Now, I'm not defending some of the decisions that were made about cutbacks or station redesign, mm -hmm. but the warning signals were there very early on. Stop designing something that you can never get built and come back into reality a little bit. You don't have to comment on that. That is my, my chastising some folks who did that. But in the construction zone, um, so the Broadway Bridge, there was no alternative that was cost effective to keep it open for pedestrians or bicyclists or motorists. Because of the way the bridge is designed, it has to be completely demolished and then restructured. That's right. To accommodate the platform, to accommodate the traffic, to accommodate the headhouse, because that headhouse is cantilevered off the bridge. That's right. It ties into the bridge. That's right. right. Mm -hmm. So I hope that satisfies some folks who are upset about the closure of the bridge. The secondary part of this is, and one of the reasons I wanted you to come back, is that the city of Somerville has ponied up some money for shuttling folks who may not be able to walk the distance in the detour that's been, 
They've also thrown some money at public safety. I know the police, the fire, fire department, police department, everybody was in front of the city council recently laying out their plans for the public safety. So the shuttle, I, I had an update today. I think the shuttle is scheduled to begin um, next week. I can't say the date because I don't think that they knew what day. Um, but the shuttle system to get people around, mobile, mobility impaired folks, um, seniors who won't want to walk that during inclement weather, moms with strollers, I mean, all of that. You know, I, I said publicly, John, I'm healthy enough that I can find my way to Ball Square from my house, which is a block from Broadway mm -hmm. in the Magoon Square, Square District. I can find my way to Ball Square very easily. The Ball Square Bridge is not the end of the bridge reconstructions in the city. It, are there any other bridges that you know of right now, barring you might run into something, that has to be completely closed yes. for traffic, yeah. pedestrian, and bicyclists? Uh, yes. Broadway Bridge is one of several that close completely. Um, the ones that are kind of closest in front of us um, after Broadway, but soon after Broadway closes, is Washington Street Bridge in East Somerville, Washington Street. Um, and then sometime this summer, uh, Medford Street will close. Um, both of those are, Broadway's the longest closure in duration. Um, Washington's a little different animal. Uh, it closes for about an eight month period this stretch, and then next construction season, spring of 2020, it closes for about four or five months. Uh, and then Medford Street closes uh, for a shorter period as well when mm -hmm. it closes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there, there are those three and then even beyond that and sort of the, the out years, we, you know, eventually for the same reasons, either widening or again, creating that, that, that envelope of space for the future Green Line tracks, um, we need to close other bridges as well. Okay. But Joe, I wanna go back to something you said. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned the, mayor's, the mayor and, and um, his support of the project and, and the, the, the city council of, of Somerville, um, you know, I've been a part of projects like this in, in, in different different places in this country and, and overseas, and the, the partnership we've had with the mayor's office has just been unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, mayor Curtis Tony and his staff, um, Brad Rawson to name to name one, but but many others um, have just been clear and, and willing to accept the inconveniences this is going to mean to their neighbors and their constituents, but also helps getting the message across that. Let's endure the pain for, for the game, mm -hmm. because when we're finished and public transit is coming or rail transit is coming to parts of, of this region that haven't seen it in in many 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 years in some cases ever, um, you know it's going to be worth it. Um, so I just want to you know acknowledge the fact that the mayor's office and the city, and even the na the constituents and the and the abutters have been you know accepting of the inconveniences, the noise, the dirt, the trucks. I mean, it's, it's, you don't always get that, so it doesn't go unnoticed. Yeah, I think you will always have, any, anytime anybody is inconvenienced, and they know it's temporary, the bridge is a temporary closure. A year seems like a long time, it John, does. but it's it does. a temporary closure. So in order to get the Green Line, we are experiencing disruption, we're experiencing detours, we're experiencing some businesses may experience some hurt, but in the long run, those are temporary. So I want to move into the construction and the station design a little bit because everyone in the city, whether you live here, you work here, or you travel through, sees the construction now. We see the clear cut on the right of way. Mm -hmm. We know that this Commonwealth owns that 80 foot wide right of way and they're going through. I live a stone's throw from the bottom of my street. I can see all the construction that's taking place. You are, I think, now I know you're doing this, some, some, some of this is where we can do construction, we're doing construction, but from my perspective, you're all the way almost up to Tufts University at this point. Mm -hmm. We see walls going in, sound walls going in, we see, if you want to address the clear cutting of the trees, you can do that, um, but that property is owned by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. This is a public infrastructure project. When do you think, I'm not going to hold you to it, but people are asking me, Sure. when do the stations begin? When do we start to see the stations built? The stations are very much towards the back end of the project. Um, as, you, as you rightfully said, the green line is going to be built in what is an existing 
um, rail corridor for the existing MBTA commuter tracks, <clears throat> which um, in some places, in fact, in most places is only currently wide enough to, you know, allow the two in, the inbound and outbound commuter tracks to, 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 to run, which means, you know, the, 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 the biggest effort at the moment in simple terms is to widen that cut. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why, you know, partly why, to your point about the trees, much of the earth upon which many of those trees, you know, grew up and, and unfortunately I'll say had to be cut down is because that earth upon which they grew is going away mm -hmm. because the corridor is going to be widened. Mm -hmm. So just to follow, finish that thought about the trees, so not only is the, is the, is the, is the, the earth going away, but, you know, one thing that's been demonstrated a lot in the last couple of years on not only the MBTA's Green Line tracks elsewhere, but, but kind of on the commuter tracks across the entire MBTA system is that trees and public transit, especially rail transit, are, are a bad combo, combination, especially, especially when you have the, the system that will power the Green Line trains, the mm -hmm. overhead catenary system, right. or the OCS, right. just cables strung you know, from, from mile post to mile post. Trees coming down, which happened an awful lot last summer and the summer before, <clears throat> renders the system out of service. Right. So, so can, I, can I try to do in layman's term? Please. I used to take the Riverside line out to, um, what's, the, what's the end of it? Riverside. Mm -hmm. The end mm -hmm. of the stop is Riverside. And I would be disrupted by that very reason because they are running with the catenary system above it. The tree comes down, knocks out the power, you're dead in the water. Totally. And we've seen that every winter mm -hmm. on the Green Line system that runs on that. So. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of folks in the city of Somerville that don't understand how, what's going to power that green line. So these tall, like, steel trees are going to be going up at some point, mm -hmm. and the system runs on those. Yes. So I just want, you know, for my fellow Somervillians, don't be surprised, you know, if you've been paying attention and playing along for the last 10 years, that's how it's powered. That's right. Okay. That's right. The vehicles of this nature have different power sources. Some some systems, in fact, some parts of the MBTA subway system are powered by third rail, which mm -hmm. is you know the, the power is basically brought up from below the right. tracks. <clears throat> but other other systems like the Green Line um, has what we call overhead power delivery. Right. So that's what you're talking about. Yeah. So let's go into station design. I, I we were talking before. There is a lot of concern about ADA compliance, and my. My conversation with John before the show was, it is beyond my comprehension why anyone would think that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts would be building new stations, 21st century stations, that are not in compliance. But the pushback is coming because they think there's a problem with the design about making people walk too far or making people um, not feel safe because they're partly on T property, partly on public property. Do you want to address it? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So part of what my charge is, is to make sure really two things from a, from a compliance perspective. One is that <clears throat> the project satisfies our obligations as defined in the full funding grant agreement. That, that FFGA is the contract that the MBTA has with the Federal Transit Administration mm -hmm. to say, Federal Transit Administration, you provide some, some portion of the funds to build this project, we in turn will deliver a project that you tell us to deliver. Mm -hmm. So, you know, much of what kind of governs our day-to-day -day decisions is making sure we're compliant with the full funding grant agreement or the FFGA. <clears throat> I also have to make sure we're compliant with, with building code, uh, construction law, and any, any um, um, compliance laws such as ADA. So um, there are multiple wickets that design documents must go through to com ensure compliance. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, the, 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 the designing team, the designers who are part of the design build consortium that we selected, mm -hmm. um, must, you know, they are charged legally to comply with, with ADA and everything else. Right. So they, they have to stamp those drawings to acknowledge, yep, everything we're doing complies with everything we're supposed to comply with. My team, my MBA, MBTA team receives those drawings and does a review, not just of ADA, but of you know structural compliance, 
um, other code. I mean, just every, to make, make sure that everything is where, is where it should be and complies. Depending on what the special uh, discipline is, we also sometimes farm those out, those drawings or those plans out to other specialty reviewers. And in this case, we do look to uh, the MBTA's um, system-wide accessibility office to mm -hmm. perform their review and make sure, yep, thumbs up, everything's, you know, checks out. So, <clears throat> um, I have, admittedly, I've heard some talk about the fact that the stations are not complying with ADA. Um, I've revisited that topic since hearing that um, not so long ago and, and confirmed that um, there, there's, there's, no, there's no area where we are not complying with ADA. So or what's other the public code. perception? Is there a perception problem or is, is the way that these are being designed is right up to the line of ADA in compliance? I mean, does that make sense that some people are perceiving that these are not in compliance? I, tr I trust that the federal government is not going to give the Commonwealth of Massachusetts a billion bucks and let them go out of compliance on this stuff. Nor will your boss, Secretary Pollack, sign That's right. off on stuff. Nor will Governor Charlie Baker because the other money is coming from the Commonwealth. Yep. So why do we have that perception problem? Um, I, I think that's a good question. And, and quite frankly, when this has been brought up, um, it, it, was, it was simply a statement that we fear there's no, not compliance. Um, I mean, if, if people can point, and I, and I mean this sincerely, to where there is a belief that we are not compliant, and I, I draw a distinction between compliance and a want to have. Right. And, and, right. I, and, I, and, I, and I, I think it's a, it's a, it needs to be a bright line. Um, you know, I, I'd like to hear that. But I think to answer your question, where is there a, where is it coming from? Um, I, I did hear or read something recently that said, um, you know, people who are not, not uh, in wheelchairs would have a shorter path to travel to enter the station. Anything we're designing achieves what we call equi equ equitability, where there's no, there is no different path for people who are in wheelchairs only and people who are not in wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. So. I, I think that might, to answer your question, might be part of um, where the where the the conversation is coming from. But um, I, I just don't think it's an accurate assessment. Okay. Station design. Uh, one of the other things that I heard, and you and I have a mutual friend in Assistant Secretary Kate Fichter. Um, one of the other things, because it was such a shock to the system that we have these, you know, Disneyland like stations that everybody thought were going to be delivered. Then they got too expensive when we had to pare back. The other thing that I've been hearing, and I'm sure that some of the elected officials are hearing, is that it's a platform with a canopy. You know, during a snowstorm, what's, what's there to protect us? Mm -hmm. Do you ever think about a glass box on <laughs> every platform? I know you got a lot of money stashed away for contingency and overruns. and Yeah, we do have contingency. Absolutely. Can we have glass boxes over all these platforms? Glass and boxes. Keep us, keep us warm in winter and keep us cool in the summer. Interesting. Interesting. That's an interesting idea, Joe. Um, <laughs> I, I'm putting my pitch in now, yeah, John. That's I fair. got you sitting here. That's fair. So. Take advantage of it. Um, so, I, you know, as I said it early on, people have good ideas, and, and I don't dismiss any of them. Um, however, however, um, I think people need to remember or just learn about a couple details that I'll, 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 I'll say. Um, the first is that we procured this delivery model through what was called design build. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I know you've heard that Joe and, and a lot of your, your listeners have heard it. <clears throat> but what design build does, and it is a different process to where people are accustomed to and in, in more, I'll call traditional, um, capital infrastructure public projects like the Green Line is. Um, in other delivery vehicles, um, particularly design bid build, which is sort of what you know is, is more standard, there is a design process where the owner, or the MBT in this case, engages a design firm to develop the designs, and that, that design firm takes the design to 100%, where every detail is defined and there is no room for interpretation and the owner has absolute control or the owner or the the, the, in, the groups that are influencing design have absolute control of what that's going to look like. Those documents are then taken and bid out to the construction community and the contractors 
look at the drawings and put together their estimate and submit that, uh, that estimate, that number, that proposal price to the owner. Mm -hmm. So you have design, you have a bid process, mm -hmm. and then you take that envelope, usually it's the lowest price, right. and you award that contract to the builder and the build. So it's design, bid, build. There's lots of great things about that model. You have a whole lot more control of what design looks like ultimately. Um, and you have different entities to control, which I would say is actually not so ideal. What, the design, what, the, what GLX is, in contrast, is design build, mm -hmm. where the owner engages a design build entity to do both the design and the build, design mm -hmm. and construction. Mm -hmm. What is given to the competing firms at the time of procurement is not 100% drawn plans with every detail scripted out. Instead, performance requirements are provided. So that you're saying there's still room for those glass boxes, air conditioned and heated. So here's my answer. Here's my answer. <laughs> and this is- and, and I'm looking for the opening. I know, you're trying, it's good, it's good. <laughs> we are very early on in this project to talk about any additive items. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it is- You don't know what the cost is gonna be in a year. You don't know what the cost is gonna be. You may run into problems. That's the thing. Right. I mean, as I said initially, we talked about, you know, so much of this project is widening the corridor. We have an idea of what we're gonna cover or encounter as we pull all that earth out, mm -hmm. but there's, you know, it's unknown. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, so much of this project, you mentioned the noise walls and other underground structures. We are building a viaduct to carry a lot of the future Green Line trains, you know, elevated through certain parts of the alignment right. to, to clear, right. you know, other tracks or whatever. If you look at the noise wall drilled, the, the noise wall foundations, those viaduct founda foundations, there are more than 1,600 drilled structures or mm -hmm. underground structures on this project. And every one of those is a theoretical risk opportunity right and you know so i have to kind of protect that risk opportunity meaning it could cause a delay or a risk threat or, or cost more money yeah right. both right. both so there's that big kind of risk bucket on the table and the other one is you know we're tying into a system with a a a, a modern uh keep going but i gotta have you finish the thought and you're going to make a commitment that you want to come back to, right? Every time. All right. Always. All always. Right. Let me just finish this thought. So not only do you have the underground risk elements, but there's also tying in a, a brand new modern transit system into existing, right. very old one. And there's always interface issues that until you do it, do it, it's always... We're going to find you some more money. Okay. I'm going to go talk to Secretary Pollock and Charlie Baker. John Dalton, thanks for coming sure. back. Always come a pleasure. Come back anytime. Okay. Thanks. My guest has been John Dalton, GLX General Manager. As always, stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you next time. Come back.